thank you everyone for staying and um, you know and I know it's getting late my stomach tells me it's getting late so um, I'm going to talk today about migratory connectivity of, of oven birds using light level geolocators unlike these bigger birds we're not at the point yet where we can track them with satellites so geolocators is, is the best that we can do so what is connectivity and why is it important and difficult to measure it's well connectivity is the geographic link between breeding and non-breeding populations and the reason that it's so difficult to measure is because we have to track individuals throughout the entire year right and what if we don't have these satellites it's very difficult to track birds throughout the year or individuals the best that we can do is these banding data with mark recaptures and for the vast majority of birds this is all that we have right and for some birds like the brant it's pretty incredible we get high rates of returns for for bands right um, but for some birds like the oven bird for example we have far fewer we that was shown a little earlier with uh, hummingbirds as well but the unfortunate thing here is this also includes encounters during migration Right? And that doesn't give us an idea of where those birds are breeding and the non-breeding location. Right? So if we get rid of these migration points, this is what we have. This is over 100 years, or from 1914 to 2011 for oven birds. So it doesn't give us that much resolution. Right? Um, so we need to track these, in, these birds throughout the year without having marked recapture um, studies. So Geolocators are our best bet for these small birds, okay? They're passive extrinsic markers, so they wear them as backpacks. Um, they need to be deployed and then recaptured. And the one downside is that there's a fair amount of error, and I'll show you what that looks like. There is um, some weight restrictions, right? The Fish and Wildlife Service says less than 5% of the body weight can be that backpack. Um, they're relatively expensive in terms of in comparison to say band recoveries or stable isotopes, right? Um, they're about $180 a piece, at least that's what they were when I started using them. And um, they've only been deployed on a handful of species. It's increasing rapidly, but only a handful of species. Do we actually know what's going on with um, connectivity based on geolocators? But our understanding of migratory connectivity for these small birds has improved dramatically because of these geolocators. Unfortunately, most of them are biased towards the breeding season. So where are the breeding birds wintering, right? Because that's where we're putting out these geolocators. And they're only put out in a few spots throughout the distribution of the breeding. So what I did is I put geolocators out six locations, two widely separated places in the breeding season of the oven bird. So here's the oven bird breeding distribution in blue and non-breeding here in orange. We put them out um, a bunch of geolocators in um, Canada and then also at Hubbard Brook in New Hampshire. And then in the winter, I put out geolocators in four different places. Here in, in Belize, Everglades National Park, here in Jamaica, and also in Guanica Dry Forest in Puerto Rico. Then I had to go back the next year and recapture these guys. <clears throat> okay, so. It's important to note that strong connectivity, so birds that are going from one particular breeding site going to a particular non-breeding site, it's not just black and white. It's not just weak and strong, right? There's this gradation of connectivity. And we predict that oven birds have strong-ish connectivity. So how do these geolocators work? Well, they record light levels every two minutes, depending on what model you're using. And from that data, we record sunrise and sunset. And from those data, you can get latitude and longitude, right, with some degree of error. And then, most importantly, these, these things need to be recaptured to get any data whatsoever, right? We can't use those nice um, telemetry things where they beam you the data if you're close. We actually have to get our hands on these guys. Okay, so I said there was lots of error, and this is what the raw data kind of look like. So it's anybody's guess where those birds actually were, right? So um, what we did to kind of hone in on the data a little bit was we determined non-breeding and breeding periods of the year. And our data suggests that they're moving in October. And, they're, and so our first non-breeding 
spot or uh, duration started November through March 31st um, because they start moving in April. Importantly, the equinox, when latitude and longitude can't be estimated with any accuracy, we don't use those data. So really, non-breeding was from November 1st to March 30th. <clears throat> we also classified breeding sites um, was May, June 1st sorry, to July 31st, because they were moving in August and they were moving in May. So we took those data and we created kernel density estimates, one for the non-breeding, one for the um, breeding. Um, the precision, if that's what you want to call it, was uh, about 500 square kilometers, right? Um, and it didn't differ between breeding and non-breeding. And that includes areas that had open water, right? So we wanted to refine these estimates a little bit. And so what we did, actually, was use citizen science, right? We used breeding bird data, um, which has been ongoing since 1966, to refine our breeding estimates using a Bayesian framework. And we overlaid uh, the kernel density estimates using this bird abundance as prior information. There isn't so much data for the non-breeding season. Actually, there's no range-wide data except for eBird data. So I had to go through and make an eBird abundance map for oven birds. And what I did is I used NDVI as a proxy for habitat quality. So any um, from November to March, I looked at that difference or that change in NDVI. So any value that's negative indicates the site that was browning. And any site that's um, positive indicates a site that's greening throughout the season. What we found is that oven birds really are, um, have high abundance in areas that are browning throughout the season. We also incorporated elevation, elevation squared in the model, and we used ob observation minutes because that was a stronger predictor of, of detection than the number of actual counts. Um, so this is what those data look like for oven birds. And we used the beta estimate of all three of these to actually create an abundance map of oven birds in the winter. Okay? I'm sorry this kind of doesn't look so pretty, but green areas are high abundance, and this kind of beige is where there aren't many birds. So. We recaptured 44 geolocators total, which, in terms of geolocator studies, that's not too shabby. Um, and we caught 16 in the non-breeding grounds. Basically, I went out for two weeks, put them on, flew out, then came back the next year, tried to catch them for two weeks without knowing where their territories were. Um, so I, di I didn't do so bad, I didn't think, except for in Belize, which we didn't recapture any of our individuals that didn't have geolocators either. So um, I have some hypotheses what's going on there, and we can talk about those at some point. But um, in New Hampshire, where I also do an intensive breeding study, we caught um, a fair, bo fair bit more. And it's the only site that I can actually compare the survival estimates with geolocators and non-geolocated birds. And we found that actually survival, this includes detection, was actually higher for geolocated birds than it was for non-geolocated. OK, so here is what the data actually look like. This is a combined kernel density estimate for all birds captured at one site. This is what the abundance map looks like. Um, I'm sorry, what the, uh, the non-breeding distribution looks like of without incorporating breeding bird abundance, but taking out areas where they wouldn't be, like over open ocean. Right? Um, so it looks OK. But with, in, with incorporating breeding bird abundance, we get a much finer resolution of where those birds might actually be going. And so this is what they look like side by side. And the most interesting part, or most exciting part for me anyways, is that the potential area where those birds went decreased by 62%. So we can really refine where those birds might be going, incorporating this uh, abundance. Here's where the non-breeding birds went. So this here is where birds from, from um, Puerto Rico went in the summer, and it's kind of widely distributed over eastern North America. And from Everglades, we had a couple birds go into the mid-Atlantic, and then one bird went pretty far north. In Jamaica, they all seem to be going to southern New England here. Um, and this is what the map looks like, the bottom tier, what it looks like 
after incorporating breeding bird abundance into those estimates. And we found that the estimates were decreased by 90%. That, so it really refined where those birds are likely going. So that was pretty, I, was, I liked that result. But here's why I'm really in part of this symposium here, the spring migration. So we saw this kind of dichotomy between east and west population. We want to really figure out why that might be going on. We thought maybe spring migration routes or migration routes in general were to blame for that separation. And we can only look at spring migration routes because oven birds left in the fall during that equinox period. So we can't really estimate some of these locations. So just to refresh your memory, um, non-breeding was between November 1st and March 31st, these kernel density estimates that I made, and breeding was uh, June 1 through July 31st. And so I determined the start of migration when points fell outside the winter kernel density estimate. So it, say this was the kernel density estimate here, the first point that left that 95% confidence interval, that's when we determined migration to start. And then when this point fell within the kernel density estimate during the breeding season, that's when we said migration had ceased. From those data, these are the actual raw points here, um, we calculated the most probable migration route and the 95% confidence interval around that migration route using KF track, um, which incorporates error in latitude and longitude from the known locations where we put those geolocators. Now, there are a few important assumptions. First, is that the error rate in geolocator estimates is constant throughout the year, right? And that the start and end locations were known. That's not exactly true for all of this, right? Because we know where it started or where I caught it, but we don't know where it ended, right? So I just picked the middle of the kernel density estimate weighted by the kernel density estimate, if that makes any sense. Um, Okay, so those are some key assumptions. And from those data, those points, um, these are the migration routes, the spring migration routes for all 44 of those geolocator birds, with the exception of one, because it had died um, during the winter. The geolocator died. Um, so birds from Hubbard Brook here, a lot of them are migrating across the eastern seaboard here um, into, Dominica, into the Hispaniola area. Some are going what looks like across Bahamas. Um, some of these birds from he Prince Albert Forest National Park in um, Saskatchewan, they are going over the Caribbean and some are going around, which is quite interesting. What is interesting to note here is that there is essentially zero overlap between these two populations, east and west. And um, we can talk about why I think that might be later. Um, here's the Puerto Rico birds moving north, some stop here in the mid-Atlantic. Interestingly, one bird from Florida, the next day his point was in the estimate for um, the breeding location. Um, so that's why that's a straight line over the, the eastern seaboard there. And these are birds here from Jamaica going across through Cuba, through Florida, and then up. So just to remind you, but migratory connectivity, how it ranges from, from weak, potentially, where there is no real pattern to strong. Um, I want to put this map back up from the east and west here with this strong connectivity here. And if I make this schematic look kind of similar, we find strong connectivity at large spatial scales. Right? So we have no overlap between eastern birds and western birds, at least in this big um, broad spatial scale. And these um, dotted lines here are those three band recaptures. However, within subpopulations, we see a bit of a weaker pattern, right? Um, so, especially birds here in Canada, which showed the weakest connectivity, there were some birds, two birds went here in northern Central America, a couple birds in Central Central America, and a couple birds went further south in Central America with essentially no overlap in some of those individuals. Uh, Hubbard Brook in, in New Hampshire showed a high degree of likely coming from Hispaniola. 
Um, most of the individuals went there, but some also went to eastern Cuba, it seems. Um, and Puerto Rico birds, it was a mix between a couple going further north in New England and some stopping here in the, in the mid-Atlantic region. And um, this is Jamaica, and they all seem to be going into the southern um, New England. So within these subpopulations, we're seeing a bit of a weaker pattern than we see at this large spatial scale, broad, broad spatial scale. Oops. Um, so, in, so starting this conclusion here, that incorporating breeding bird, bird abundance really decreased our estimates in error. So it improved, I don't know, I can't say improved, but it decreased the potential area of origin by 90% during the breeding season and 62% during the non-breeding season. That even includes after removing open water. And we found strong spatial scale, uh, strong, sorry, connectivity is strong at broad spatial scales, but weaker within these spatial scales, um, within populations. Okay, so this is what the meat and potatoes of this talk really is that what does this mean for conservation, right? And how do we use this? Because for these small birds, this is the best that we can do. Right? We don't have these satellite trackers, so how do we know where to conserve? This is really important. So what, so what kind of predictions can we make from these estimates that we found? So birds, say, from Puerto Rico, how might they respond to large um, forest alteration in the eastern part of the United States? And what might we expect if um, some uh, hurricane moves through Central America? Where do we expect those populations to respond in the breeding season? And what happens, can we look at finer scales in terms of population trends? Let's say that oven birds or birds in general aren't doing so well here in North Carolina. May it be reasons here in North Carolina or where they're going in the winter? Um, and it's important to note, well, yeah, population response and population dynamics in different areas. So what are the, what are the implications of conservation in certain areas? Where do we place that really limited resource, which we call money, to save habitat and birds? Right. So, um, so, so that's pain, why I'm really jazzed about connectivity, and if especially you or a loved oven one birds. Have had um, complications with an implanted pelvic yeah, mesh device so or bladder with that, sling. We're going to get out of here a little early. Call the group at one eight hundred nine five three five nine zero seven. That's one eight hundred nine five three five nine zero seven. Average. It's out there. Convincing you that no, they were they're definitely wintering there, but that was the only that was the wettest site that I worked in, and um, we were there in the middle of the drought. So I think some of those birds that were in the drier habitats moved into the wet area where I was. When I went back the next season, it was in the middle of the rainy season. So I think some of those birds had moved back to their original territories and where their food resources were likely higher. That's we didn't find any even birds without geolocators at all. So. Yeah. I was just wondering, like looking at two points or two, you know, a few ends mm -hmm. in terms of when you're thinking about the broad kind of thing, like the ends that follow the mm -hmm. It kind of seems like right now you can say you have some kind of geographic separation. So wouldn't you want to have more points um, come across that spectrum in terms of to say whether or not as you go farther east or farther west? Yeah, mo yeah. So most, most certainly, right? I would love to work in those high, where the density is highest or abundance is highest, and say like Michigan area. That is kind of where I would love to put some of these out because that's likely where it's you know the split is happening. My feeling is that it's the Appalachian Mountains though, um, and birds on the east are going to the Caribbean, birds on the west are going into Central. We haven't looked at that yet, but that's coming in the future. That's part of what we'd like to go with this, is kind of use that. Um, there are differences in, bird so in oven bird song, um, so there may be some genetic differences as well. We're not sure. Can you say the survival of the birds with geolocators is better than the ones without? <laughs> yeah, actually, it, it, no, no, no. It was better. It's higher. Even accounting for, I, I do think that's real. They're like, 
oven birds are like dump trucks. Um, so they're always on the ground, and except for when they're migrating for the most part. So this added weight likely doesn't have that much of an impact, say like it does on barn swallows, which have been shown to not have the best effects of geolocator, um, which are always on the wing. So these guys forage on the ground and likely can handle the weight better. Yeah. I know. Well, so there's no so let me there's no significant difference, but it it does have a higher estimate. So the the conference intervals overlap, but it is higher than control birds. I did I I did both. I should have mentioned, and I'm sorry that I hadn't. That these are just males because females. It's a bugger to catch females because um, they don't respond to. The playbacks and their nests are relatively hard to find, so um, these are just male oven birds. What about we 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 use playback as well, um, but we also use passive nets, so we don't know because they're indistinguishable, right? So we don't. Yeah. Yeah. It might be. The short answer is we don't know if they're males or females on the winter. We'd need to do some genetics. Yeah? Thanks for staying. Hey, there'll be a drone discussion right next door.